Um, anyway, a couple of things that we do need to pray for as we get ready to pray. We need to pray for, for some folks that we have that are sick and some that are hurting in hospitals and all kinds of stuff. Uh, we've got a, a, a pretty extensive prayer list and uh, we need to keep remembering those, remember our shut-ins, and pray for our uh, missionaries all around the world. I also wanted to let you guys know, I meant to say something this morning um, and at church, and I'll probably mention it later. I, I preached a men's, re, a re, uh, whatever it's called, uh, over at Rapidan. So our women go to the women's one. And I had never been to the men's one. They had asked me to, to preach it, so I went over and did it. That was absolutely a blast. And so we're going to do that next year. Um, the cost is minimal. It's like 50, 60 bucks, something like that. They feed you. They house you. We had a skeet shoot. They provided the guns and the ammunition. Uh, we had all kinds of competition. We made beef jerky. They provided all the meat. I mean, it is, it is a really, it was a blast. It was fun. We had a backhoe competition and a back up the truck competition and a nail driving and a screw driving competition and a cornhole, all kinds of stuff. And it was, and we still had time for preaching three times. So it was a, it was a whirlwind of a weekend, but it was great. And uh, you don't have to worry about hotels. You don't have to worry about having to go pay for your meals and all that stuff. And so we're going to do that next October. So men, plan on that, all right? And if you ain't got the money to pay for it, come next October, um, see me. And I'll tell you, you should have started now since I told you now. <laughs> but it, it was a blast. And so um, anyway, I, hopefully we'll, we'll do that next year, okay? Um, so let's pray, and then Miss Christine, you come on up, okay? Father God, thank you so much for giving us this day. And Lord, we lift up those who are, are hurting and sick. Lord, we especially, today we lift up uh, uh, the crows, Jim and Barbara. Pray, Lord, you watch over them. We lift up Miss Patsy to you. Pray, Lord, you bless her, uh, meet her needs, and watch over her and Dave. And, and Father, we lift up to you those that are in uh, harm's way around the world, uh, our missionaries, Father, uh, especially, Father, those that are, are in those countries that uh, Islam is, is seemingly on an uprise against uh, anti-Semitism and anti-Americanism. And, and, Father, I just pray that you would watch over them, meet their needs. And, Father, we lift up Billy to you. I pray, Lord, you'd help him to continue to get strong and, and have the stamina uh, that he needs. And, and, Lord, you know all of these needs. There's so many, and I'm sure I've forgotten many. But, Lord, we especially today, we lift up Israel to you. Father, it seems like our world is right on the verge of just exploding into World War III. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would um, just give, give some wisdom to those who are in leadership of nations. And, and Lord, uh, that you, you know what's needed. And Father, never, nevertheless, not our will be done, your will be done. And Father, we have read in, in your word where it comes to this in the, these last days and and Father, if this is it, then I pray, Lord, you would help us to be close, uh, know that it's close, and be ready to be within your presence. Father, there's so many things on my heart this morning, but Lord, I just pray that you would help us to be ready if this is the day that you call us to yourself. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Miss Christine, you give us an update. I read this because I'm reading it from a tiny uh, phone screen instead of a printed out letter. So, um, so Pastor Israel uh, named his um, message this time as miracles. And he quotes Isaiah 51, 6, Lift up your eyes to the heavens, look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever, my righteousness will never fail. Oops. After one year of daily rocket attacks on Israel from the Hezbollah terrorists in Lebanon, Israel has finally had enough. Um, and just to give you a little information, as of today, 
not just from Hezbollah, but from Hamas in the south, their total of missile attacks has been over 23,000. Um, so that just, if that gives you a little bit of perspective of how God's protection has been on this tiny, tiny little country of Israel. This Goliath has been challenging and taunting the state of Israel together with its sponsor, Iran, and other Iranian proxies in Yemen, Iraq, and Syria, known as the Axis of Evil. The Lord did a mighty miracle when no one got killed in April when Iran attacked Israel with over 360 projectiles, including 64 ballistic missiles. On October 1st, Iran sent 181 ballistic missiles to Israel and only one death, which was a Palestinian living in the West Bank. The Lord continues to do his mighty work and to show his power. We stand in amazement. If you know anything about what had to happen um, throughout this war in general for such a low number of casualties, you'll know that what we witnessed is the equivalent of God splitting the sea right before our eyes. When God split the sea, there were those who didn't believe it was a miracle and didn't jump in, and there are those also those who feel the need to explain it naturally, and that's fine. <clears throat> if you don't want to call what happened with the ballistic missiles against Israel um, and the protection and act of God, that's your choice. But we have to, and if you look at these events objectively, you have a really hard time seeing those hundreds of deadly missiles land in empty spaces and not see the hand of God. Last night was an incredible display of the collaboration between the two powers of the, that protect the Jewish people, the IDF and God. Last night will go down in history right alongside many of Israel's accomplishments in this war, including the beepers and the unprecedented low ratio between combatant and civilian as a military operation the likes of which the world has never seen ever. Last night will be analyzed by military strategists and experts for generations. Last night we witnessed history. Last night we witnessed open miracles. Last night, we witnessed God in all his glory watching over his children. The more we see this war unfold, the more we understand that God is in control. Throughout the history of the Jewish people, God revealed himself in very unique and powerful ways. And more often than not, he creates situations more impossible than possible to show his power. He ramps up the odds so high that there is no other plausible explanation than simply that God is doing it. Praise the Lord that he gave us eyes to see and discern that he is at work. One year ago, Israel found herself in a terrible place. There was huge splits in the government and in society on many levels. The focus was all internal and people were angry and frustrated. This is exactly what our enemies were waiting for because any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and a house divided against itself will fall. That's from Luke 11:17. For two decades, they have been preparing for this very day and October 7th to be pre present itself. Billions of dollars of aid were used to build complex networks of underground tunnels and accumulate huge stockpiles of ammunition. For years, the children and communities have been indoctrinated to hate the Jews and to dehumanize them. The heroes of their children are not Superman, but Hamas terrorists. And this idea was fully encouraged and nurtured by the parents. They made alliances with the other Jew-hating nations, trained up a strong and sophisticated army, and plotted together in the axis of evil. 
All of this was done with one singular goal in mind, to destroy the Jewish people from the face of the earth and to wipe the state of Israel from the map and from human history. Now put that into the context of the geological ratio, tiny little Israel against 22 Arab nations, a 76-year-old nation plucked from the last furnaces of the Holocaust, multiple wars on the modern Israel, attacked by these same nations and the subsequent defeat of these nations and pair it with the astonishing success of Israel as a nation on many spheres and still growing. And what do we see? The one thing that the Arabs have learned is that none of them can conquer Israel alone. Even when working together, they cannot conquer Israel. Even with bigger armies and enormous amounts of bombs, they cannot conquer Israel. Their surprise attacks get thwarted because Israel receives intel in the nick of time. Their big threatening ballistic missiles are not able to kill any Israelis. As one Gazan put it, how is it that one ballistic missile from Iran kills 200 Syrians, but 200 ballistic missiles from Iran can't kill even one Israeli? After one year of intense warfare, Israel is still strong and getting stronger. Our enemies do not expect that in the least. God is busy doing the impossible. Watch this space. And then he quotes Isaiah um, 41. And let me go down. Skip that. Sorry, he always sends me lots of pictures. He says, we thank you all for your ongoing commitment to the work in Kiryat Shimona and to our congregation. Join us in thanksgiving for God's amazing protection on October 1st, for God's absolute protection, your faithful prayers that God heard and thwarted the deeply evil plans of our enemy. Please don't stop praying. Pray for and thanksgiving for the favor and intelligence that God allowed Shin Bet to pull off the most incredible Trojan horse operation with the pager and walkie-talkie explosions. Be in prayer for thanksgiving to God for the head of Hezbollah snake has been crushed. Nasrallah and all of his higher command have gone to meet their maker. Be in prayer for God's ongoing provision of supplies, volunteers, accommodations, and opportunities to do the task at hand for the congregation, um, for the armies that go to Lebanon to destroy Hezbollah's infrastructure. Pray for the pilots in the Air Force in general as their planes have not stopped flying overhead. Pray for strength and focus. Pray for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the government and the military leaders as they lead us through this war. Pray for all of the IDF, the IAF, and the Navy as they lead their troops into battle. Continue to pray for the Orthodox Jews and the secular as they continue to protest and complicate the work of the security forces instead of uniting and supporting them. Pray for our forces that are still in Gaza, dismantling the vast network of terror that has been developed. Pray for intelligence about the hostages and for Sinwa that they um, that this part of the war can come to an end. Um, and in case you um, have not seen any um, reports, um, they have thought they had killed Sinwa, the head of Hamas, and they have not. Um, they've come to learn that he surrounds himself um, 24 hours a day with 20 hostages. Um, he's kept in the circle, hostages are kept chained around him, and then he has a personal army that's around them. So that's how he's able to stay alive, is he is using 20 of our hostages as human shields, um, which is... Um, the delay in him being defeated. So continue to pray that um, they find a way to, to get those hostages. Um, pray for the 
pray for the hostages, those that are still alive after 11 months in captivity. Pray that the Lord will meet them where they are and reveal himself to them. Pray for the families and orphans who are grieving the loss of their loved ones since October 7th. Um, and please pray for the salvation of Israel. He quotes Nehemiah 8.10, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Let us look forward to the coming king, because his reward is with him, and he will avenge his enemies. With love in Messiah Yeshua, Pastor Israel, wife Marty, and our children, Jonathan, David, and Gabriella. Thank you, Christine. I couldn't imagine being living over there right now, could you? What a mess. What a mess that is. But God, if you, honestly, folks, if you don't pay attention to what's going on over there and you don't see the hand of God at work, you're spiritually blinded. I mean, it is a miracle some of the things that are, are taking place over there. All right, we're back in chapter number 39. I'm going to finish this chapter today. And then once I'm finished with this chapter, I'm not going to start 40 if we get there uh, early just for sake of time. Um, because chapter 40 is a standalone and I don't want to break it up. Chapter 39, if you remember right, we talked about Joseph in Potiphar's house. Remember who Potiphar was? Uh, Potiphar is a title. And so it was a man who uh, voluntarily castrated himself to have a position. And now we talked about the fact that his wife was now after Joseph and all of that. So let me pick up, back up. I know we're in verse 10, but let me back up to verse number 8. It makes a good jumping off point. And we're going to see here, Joseph not only is opposing uh, this woman's advances, but he's really opposing Satan, isn't he? And God is with him. Uh, he, he has learned all about God from a child. He learned about sacrifice. He learned all of these things. Now, he has been sold by his brothers. Uh, not really. They were going to sell him, but they were found. He was found in the pit. And the people who found him in the pit sold him. And now he finds himself here in Potiphar's house. As, as we talked about last week, God was with him. God blessed him. Now he is in second to command, uh, which really he is in command of Potiphar's house. Uh, Potiphar being the one who would have been kind of the second in command, at least in the, in the home, in that local place. And so now here he is uh, in a dilemma. And he's going to go to prison in a little while. Next week as we get to chapter 40, we're going to talk about the dreams that, ha that happened. And then God is going to bless him with the ability to be able to hear what these interpretations are from the Lord. Let me begin in verse number 8. But he refused, and this is to, to lie with, his, uh, with Potiphar's wife. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master, uh, excuse me, <coughs> behold, <coughs> excuse me, behold, my master, what is, uh, not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me uh, but thee, because thou art his wife. Uh, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Notice, this is important that we grasp this context. He said, how can I sin against God? Not just sin against my master, but how can I sin against God? Uh, it shows us that Joseph, right from the get-go here as we study the rest of this chapter, is that Joseph, not only was he God-conscious, but he was really wanting to live for God. He wanted to serve God. He wanted to be different for God. And he was different, wasn't he? And we're going to see that God is with him. No matter what happens, God is with him. Might I remind you, in the Old Testament, they weren't sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. But you and I, in the New Testament, we are. And God promises He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And God is just as much with us, actually probably even more so with us than He was with Joseph back then. And we also need to realize that Joseph didn't have the written Word of God. We do. All he had was his conscience and how God was working in him and through him in his conscience. Now, with that being said, look at verse number 10 and we'll finish this chapter. 
And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Remember, we talked about the fact that the devil does that, doesn't he? Day by day, he is constantly tempting us. And he'll tempt us if we don't fall once. He'll tempt us again and again and again. He never gives up. He doesn't sleep and he doesn't slumber. Neither does God, does he? God doesn't sleep and God doesn't slumber. The difference is, is that the devil is always working to destroy us and God is working his plan out, his purposes out. By the way, we have angels all around us. There are ministering angels. Do I have a personal angel? I don't know if I do or not. But the angels are out there that minister to us. And the angels ministered to Jesus, didn't they? There's a spiritual warfare going on that you and I can't see. And obviously this Sunday school lesson isn't the, the lesson to get into all of that. But you and I need to realize is that God knows where we are. God sees where we are. And God protects us in everything and through everything. Y'all believe that? I hope that you do believe that because we see this all the time in the Scripture and you have seen this in your life. If you've been saved for a while, you've seen God overshadow you. You've seen God protect you. If you drive down 81, God is obviously with you. <laughs> If you drive I-95, I know God's got to be with you, right? And so we, we see this all the time. God does protect us. God does uh, lead us. He does guide us. All of these things. And this is what this is about. And so here's Joseph, sold into slavery. He's being tempted day by day by day with Potiphar's wife. And yet he doesn't want to sin against God. And he is going to do the right thing, choose to do the right thing. And the whole time he's making these choices, it is actually God at work behind him. God has not forsaken him. God has not forgotten him. God has not stopped working on him. And his entire life is not about this point right here. His entire life is what God's going to do with him in the future. Our entire life is not about this point right here. Our entire life is what God's going to do with us in the future. Folks, I want you to get this. Please understand. You're going to be tempted just like he was tempted. Maybe a different sin, but it's never going to stop. The devil knows the kink, the, the, the niche, the crack in your armor. And he's going to constantly be trying to find, fire them fiery darts in there. And you know it and I know it, don't we? Y'all with me, right? And so we've got to understand, we are just like Joseph, though. God knows, God cares, and God does protect. Let's keep moving. And so it came to pass, verse number 11, about this time. So it gives us a context of, of it's a long period of time. It's a, a prolonged thing. So stop and think about this for just a minute. There are years that are taking place. Uh, many times we read this and we're like, oh, well, you know, Joseph's there and then Miss Potiphar, she's trying to get him to sleep with her for, a, you know, a week or so. No, this is day in, day out. It's a time frame, a long period of time. And this is what you need to know. Joseph, even though he was consistently time after time after time being tempted, he did not fall because he determined that he wasn't going to. And you and I can determine this as well. There are things in my life that I wish I was stronger in. How about you? And there are things that I have won victories in. How about you? Because I have determined, no, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not going there. No, I'm not going to participate. No, uh, I draw the line there. And it is interesting to me, as I have matured in my Christian walk, that line has moved. It's always moving closer to Jesus, isn't it? Are y'all alive? Y'all yes. awake? Yes. Is it or is it not? Are we not? Are we not? It, the line, I mean, I used to, we get by, by with this. Now, and I determined I'm not going to. I want to live right. Now my line is here, then my line's here. One of these days, we won't have to worry about our line moving. There won't be a line. We'll be changed completely. So notice what she said there in verse, or he said there, the Bible says, it came to pass about this time uh, that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house there within. There's some shady business here. 
Obviously, she sent him away because this is a large house. Potiphar, being a second in command, uh, Potiphar being the man of the house, uh, who is the man of the Pharaoh's house, he would have had a large house and a lot of servants. And so all these men are gone. And obviously, Miss Potiphar had planned this. She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. That's, uh, there's a whole sermon right there. So she grabbed a hold of his garment. And he was not having any of this. Why? He knew his own weaknesses. He knew his own temptations. He knew that if she got a hold of him physically, uh, he might succumb to that. He's not going to succumb to that. He leaves his garments and runs out. He gets out of the house. And he goes out of the house and he gets him out. And that's exactly sometimes what we've got to do. We've got to get ourselves away from the temptation. Let me tell you, I, I was, I was, I don't know, I was listening to somebody preach on this particular topic, and he was talking about the sins and the sins of, of humanity. And he says, we need to be like Joseph. If your sin is lying, you need to flee from that. You need to get away from that. If your sin is lust or, or, or sinful stuff, you need to get away. You really need to separate yourself from those temptational areas and from that, those triggers. Here he was, he was a slave in that house. He had no option. Are y'all listening? He couldn't leave that house. Just like today, I would love to leave this sin-cursed world and go be with Jesus, but I don't have that option. Right? right. But one day I am going to get out of here. But I do have the option if I'm in a place that where I am tempted to get out of there. Uh, you're not going to find me in a bar. Why? Because I would be tempted to just go ahead and get drunk. You're not going to find me in certain places because I have temptations. I have those temptations in my life. And so I'm going to flee from there. We've got to have that integrity. Don't stay. You linger longer, then the devil's going to get his meat hooks on you. And when he gets his meat hooks on you, you can't just run away. She grabbed his garment before she could grab his flesh. He's gone. And that's what we need to learn. The same with us. When it gets our temptation, when it gets close... Get out of there. Get out of the situation. Run away from it. It doesn't matter what people think. And it doesn't matter the outcome. Remember, he's going to run away. She's going to cry out that he tried to rape her and they're going to send him to prison. Even though he was innocent. It doesn't matter the outcome, the consequence. Get away from it. If you got a problem with your computer, get rid of it. you got a problem with a cell phone, get rid of it. You don't actually have to have that to live. Let me say that one more time. You don't actually have to have that to live. We lived a whole... Think about this. We've lived for, you know, thousands of years without electricity. Thousands of years without running water. Thousands of years without cell phones. We've lived thousands of years without tennis shoes. We don't really need all the stuff we think we need in our culture. What we need is integrity. What we need is God. And what we need is to be prepared to meet God. That's the most important thing. So she grabbed a hold of his clothes. He got him out of there. It came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. Notice that he came in unto me to lie with me and I cried with a loud voice. Let me stop because he's going to say what she said. And she's a liar. The devil's a liar. Amen. The devil is a liar. Amen. And he'll say and do anything to get you. Amen. Notice a couple of interesting things here. It came to pass when she saw that he left his garment and she was uh, for, uh, left there standing alone, she called the men. Do you know what she had planned? Those men were right there. She hated him because he was a Jew. And all, what she had planned, read this, put your human element. She was going to wait till Joseph started to do what he does and she was going to call out to those men to come in there. They were within earshot of her calling them. It was a plan. 
I want you to know the devil connives a plan. He knows how to get you. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. You need the wisdom of God. Doesn't the Bible teach us that if we need wisdom, we ask God, He gives it to us liberally? We need wisdom. I want you to know that the devil wants to destroy you. And he wants to destroy, he wants to destroy all of us. And he'll do whatever it takes. He'll pull out all the stops. So here she was, a tool in the devil's hand. And it was all about stopping the seed blessing. Please don't miss this. Had the devil got Joseph, now I'm sure that God had an alternate plan. But had the devil got Joseph, it would have messed up everything. There wouldn't be 12 tribes of Israel. Because they would have died of starvation. Are y'all listening to me? The devil is wise and the devil is smart. He knows some stuff. And all along the way, he was trying to keep the seed blessing, which is who? Jesus. He was trying to keep the Messiah from being born through this lineage. All along, every step of the way, the devil is always at work. But God is greater. And the integrity of man is greater than the devil. Please listen to me. Your integrity will destroy the devil's actions. Your integrity. You need to determine to be a righteous, a holy, an upright person. You need to determine to be different. Aren't we called to be holy, called to be different? You need to determine that. And holiness and righteousness isn't that you're going to be some weirdo over here. Holiness and righteousness is simply this. You have just determined to live a little bit different than the world. You have determined to live a, a different thought process, a different action, a different attitude, uh, different activities than the world has. And you choose to do so so that you stay close to God so that you hear from the Lord, so that you walk in the power and the might of the Lord. Y'all get that, right? All right, so we keep going. He, notice what else she said. See, he hath brought in a Hebrew to mock us. Who's the he? Her husband. She hates her husband. Men, look up here. Let me help you. Oh, please, let me help you. If you're at work... I don't care. You can be short, fat, and ugly like me. If a woman walks up to you and says, my husband just don't get it. You run. Because what she's doing in the back of her mind, she's going, you listen to me. You pay attention to me. And I need you in my life. Am I right, you conniving women? There are men that do that too. But I'm, I'm preaching here to the men this morning now. <laughs> Listen to me, men. Listen to me. If they come to you and they start talking about how bad their wife treats them and how their wife doesn't, or their husband, excuse me, how their husband, if they tell you about their wife, they really got problems. If they come to you and tell you that their husband doesn't pay any attention to them, their husband doesn't treat them right, and their husband doesn't listen to you, and then if she starts saying, oh, I wish he would listen to me like you do. Oh, I, I wish he would be kind like you're kind. Uh, my husband doesn't do anything. I wish he would give me things like you give me things or do things for me or open the door for me. You, some people are just kind-hearted, and some men are just stupid. Listen, I'm, te I'm telling you guys, I, look, I deal with this all the time. This is where things happen. And by the way, ladies, if a man comes to you and starts telling you how pretty you look, wish my, my wife would look like you, you better hold on because he's got other things in mind. We, and by the way, it's always been this way. We're living in a corrupt culture. And it's much easier to be corrupt in our generation, right? We see that. But please understand, this is so important that we get this. And so what she was doing, she was angry with her husband. And she hated, she was in, filled with hate with her husband. Her husband castrated himself to get a job. Wouldn't you be mad? I mean, if it was my son that did that, I would take him behind the woodshed and beat the tar out of him. 
but especially your husband. And so here she is. She's been denied. She's angry. She's bitter. And now here comes a man who won't succumb to her. So stop and think about the men she has outside listening. I would imagine they've been pretty busy. Are y'all listening? So they've been pretty busy. They've been pretty active their own self. And now here's one that has more integrity than they have. And he says, no, 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 day in, day out, week in, week out, no, 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 no. And he said no in front of those other men. That's why she sent those other men out. Not in Potiphar's house. That was in Pharaoh's house, but not Potiphar's house. So here we are. Are y'all listening? Did we, how many of y'all have never read it that way? You've never seen it that way, never read it that way. Most people don't. But I want you to get this. This is a conniving woman. And this, this woman, she hates Joseph. And she goes, because he's a Jew, because he's a Hebrew, he, it's because of his religion. He thinks he's better than we, than we are because we engage in this activity. And he says no. And he's mocking us. He's belittling us because we engage in that because we do that, and he thinks he's better than us. Folks, that's what the devil's going to do. He's going to use his people to mock you, to make fun of you, to ridicule you. They're going to call evil good and good evil. And this world is going to say, oh, you're a bunch of, bunch of do-gooders. Y'all think you're better than everybody else. Yep. Just because you go to church, just you think you're better than me. How many of y'all have heard that? Just because you go to church, you think you're all religious and all that, and you're better than we are. Let me tell you something. The answer is yes, I am. The answer is yes, I am. I am. Not in the flesh am I any better than anyone. But I am no longer in the flesh. I am in the Spirit. I am of God. I have been born again from above. I am indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God and I want to live a holy life. Come on. Truth and honesty goes a long way. They're going to hate you anyway. Don't be a jerk for Jesus, but be honest. Be forthright and let people know where you stand. Men, if you are not interested in any woman's advances, you make sure you tell the women around you you're not interested in any advances. Brag on your wife. Tell everybody how much you love your wife. Talk about how good your wife is to you and remind yourself how good you've got it. I mean, they may hate your guts and treat you horrible, but at least you can lie about it. <laughs> It'll keep you from worse trouble down the road. Come on. <laughs> Boy, my wife's such a good cook. It may make you vomit. But some other woman ain't going to bring you cookies. Come on. Use the old kidney. Just keep going. Everybody with me, right? If you don't laugh at it, I mean, it'll overwhelm you. This is serious business. And so here, here he, this man, imagine the integrity of this man. And it's all because he didn't want to sin against God. He had God in mind. Let's keep going. So she called those men, said they, he, her husband, brought him in to mock us. And then she said, he came in to lie with us. And with a loud voice, this is what she said. So she's running around holding his clothes. Looks pretty guilty, don't it? Although he was an honest man, full of integrity. This is what she said. It came to pass with a loud voice. She said this in verse 15. It came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried and he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. When he started to rape me, I cried and he ran away. <laughs> They'll cry on you. They'll lie on you. Come on. And they'll get you. The devil doesn't have any problem destroying your life. And the devil doesn't have any problem using his people to destroy your life. And to be honest, there's a lot of people in church that would like to listen to the lie rather than the truth. 
but God knows. And God is the only one that actually matters. How many innocent people have been sent to jail? A bunch of them. I was, I was watching the news the other morning. I don't know why. I was a glutton for punishment, I reckon. I was watching the news the other morning. Some guy had been sent to prison for rape in the 1980s. And he was, he was older than I am. It's in prison. And now DNA, which they've had since the late 80s, they never tested it. Come to find out the man's totally innocent. It was another man that is in prison for something else. When they tested his DNA, come to find out he was guilty. And so they let him out of prison. Man's entire life was ruined. But praise God, he didn't die in there. But he has missed out on everything. And do you, you know there are people that will still say, well, he, he did it. He's guilty. He, I'm sure he's guilty. Come on. It doesn't matter what other people think or say. God knows the truth. God knew the truth from the beginning. God knows what is up. All right, let me finish this chapter and we'll go home. So she laid the garment by, and then, verse 17, uh, she spake unto him to these words, saying, uh, and him, meaning Potiphar, the Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. He's mocking and making fun of me. Potiphar knew what she was about too. Listen to this. He came in to mock me. He came in to make fun of me. You did what you did. I have to have other men. And he's mocking me, making fun of me. Is that true? No. But what man is not going to believe or take his wife's side? After all, he knows he did wrong too, doesn't he? You think a man, after he does such an act to get a job, to get a position, doesn't double think that? And then give to his wife without thinking about it? Stop now. Remember the perverse culture they're living in. Potiphar was no longer able. And Potiphar was not going to judge his wife or condemn his wife for what she did. But he was going to protect his reputation. Does that make sense? Isn't this a twisted tale? Isn't this a... I mean, this is soap opera, man. This is like General Hospital stuff right here. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me that his wrath was kindled. He wasn't angry. Pay attention. He wasn't angry thinking that Joseph did that. He was angry that it came to that. And now she's trying to protect herself by lies. The other men weren't telling the truth either. He could have asked those other men, hello? They would have known. He took the easy way out. That's exactly what I was looking for. Now look at this. And so Joseph Master took him. Verse 20, and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison. He didn't deserve to get thrown in a hole. He didn't deserve to get sold into slavery. He didn't deserve to get cast into prison. But everything that is so negative and everything that is so horrible that goes on in his life, he kept his integrity with God. And God is going to use him in a mighty way. Listen, guys, if you want to be used by God, guys and gals, if you want to be used by God, keep your integrity. The world will not understand it. The people you work with will not understand it. 
People, people that are close to you sometimes will not understand it. Even people at church will not understand it sometimes. But keep your integrity. Do what's right. Be right. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. God is the only one we're worried about. And so they were bound. He was, that's where the prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord, verse 21, was with Joseph. You ought to underline that in your Bible. But the Lord... We see all this human interaction. We see all the human stuff. We see all the sinful stuff. We see the devil at work. We don't see God doing anything, do we? Did God stop this? Let me help you. No. He, can you imagine him praying, Lord, why is she doing this? Lord, help me to be strong. Lord, help me to do what's right. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. You don't see God zapping her. You don't see God killing uh, all them men. You don't see God taking out Pharaoh's house. You don't see him taking him and delivering him from his slavery. You don't see him delivering him from the prison like Paul and Silas praying at midnight and the, and the, the doors open. You don't see that. Understand this. You live a life of integrity and a life where you are surrendered to God and you live a holy life you're going to face some persecution. And God is going to allow it to happen. God's going to allow it to come. God's going to allow your life to come the way and develop the way which will work best in the long run. We all want the re release me now prayers. We all want the deliver me now prayers. We want to hear somebody come up and give a testimony where they were at war, became a prisoner of war, and they prayed to God, and then God released them from the prison. They won all their captors to Jesus. That's what we want to hear. God is the same God who allows a man in war to be captured, put into a prison cell, tortured until his, he's dead. It's the same God. Same prayers given to the same God. And God is still good, and God is still just, and God is still right. And that's the same, that's the greatest testimony ever. I was in prison. They beat me. I died. I was delivered. I was delivered from my tormentors and delivered from my detractors permanently. What a wonderful testimony that is. But we just can't hear it, right? Are y'all with me? Am I right or am I wrong? We want to hear all them Superman testimonies. We don't want to hear the ones that just aren't that great. We want to hear somebody say, I prayed for my grandma, praise God, she got up and she came home. Where's the one that said, I prayed for grandma and she died? Praise God. Was she saved? Hallelujah. Precious in the sight of the Lord's death of, her, of his saints. Praise God. She'll never have to go through suffering and you won't have to pray no more. It's a double win. It's a win-win. But we don't think that way. Let me get back to this and finish and we're going home and eat some chicken or whatever. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him, what's that next word? Mercy. Yeah. Mercy is what we really need. The presence of God in his mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. He was sold into slavery and he was such a model slave that he became somebody. Now he's in prison. He's a model prisoner and he's going to become somebody. It's not about where his body was. It was about where his mind was. Your body doesn't rule you, but your mind does. Your body doesn't lead you. Your mind does. Maybe you have pain in your body and you let your body tell you what you're going to do and not do. That's not your body. That's your mind. Now, if you got two broke legs, it don't matter how much you want to get up and walk, you're not. <laughs> but just because you got an ache or a pain, sometimes you got to will your body to do something and not succumb to your body. Am I, you get what I'm saying, right? Verse 21, the Lord is with Joseph and showed him mercy uh, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed Joseph's hand, all the prisoners that were in the prison. This just boggles my mind. I'm telling you, God was with this man because of his integrity, because of his heart. 
Because of his determination, he's going to focus on God. He wants to do what's right. And notice this, whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. Hey guys, uh, I know you're a prisoner, but let's build something. Let's clean this place. We don't need to live in filth. Let's clean it up. Let's, let's build something. Let's do something. Let's make something of ourselves. That's the kind of people God really does use for great things. And the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord made it to prosper. Joseph was just a dude like us. But he had determined he was going to live for God. And when he determined he was going to live for God and wanted to do what God wanted him to do, where his body was was not the, the issue. It's where his heart and his mind dwelt. And then all that he found himself to do, he did it unto the glory of the Lord. It, doesn't the New Testament tell us to do that? Whatsoever, whatsoever we find ourselves to do, we're to do it to the glory of God. So there's a lot in there, isn't it? Amen. Um, moral of the story, don't be a Potiphar. Or his wife. There you go. All right. Anybody got any quick questions, cares, comments, concerns before we go? All right. Anybody like to volunteer to close us out? Thank you, Rob. Amen.